Welcome to Lecture 23 of BIB 102 New Testament Survey. Today's lecture is going to be finishing up the pastoral epistles by going through the books of 2 Timothy and Titus. So let's begin. Concerning the introductory material for the book of 2 Timothy, letter A, this book was written by Paul. This is not disputed. It is said expressly in 2 Timothy 1, verse 1. And then letter B, this book was written sometime between A.D. 64 and 68. This book was written during Paul's second and final Roman imprisonment. An individual named Tychicus was being sent to Ephesus to replace Timothy so that he would be able to join Paul in his last days. And then letter C, this book was obviously written to Timothy. Now let's look at Roman rule 2. What was the purpose and importance of the book of 2 Timothy? Well, there are two primary reasons why Paul wrote the second letter to Timothy. The first was to warn, exhort, and instruct him concerning the ministry. This is still one of the pastoral epistles. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. All three of those make up those books specifically written by Paul to address the ministry and the minister. Well here, even though he's getting to the end of his life, he still wants to focus on matters that he felt were important for the ministry. But also, letter B, it was to summon Timothy to be with Paul in Rome. Knowing he was going to be put to death, he was at the end of his life, his gospel ministry, Paul sends word to get Timothy to come be with him in Rome before he dies. Now let's look at the major teachings in the book of 2 Timothy. In chapter 1, Paul urges Timothy to be unashamed of the testimony of Christ. Here in this epistle, he starts off by declaring that Timothy should not be ashamed of Jesus' testimony, nor should he be ashamed of Paul's imprisonment. He explains that since Jesus is the one that saved them and gave them a holy calling, they should never be ashamed to stand up for him. However, Paul did not just tell Timothy to be unashamed. He lived the life. He, he will end up giving his own life as an example of how he himself was not ashamed of Jesus. And then letter B. In chapter 2, Paul gives several illustrations for Timothy to be strong in the service of Christ. Here in this section, Paul uses six illustrations to demonstrate to Timothy how he should be strong in the service of the Lord. The first illustration is that he should be strong in the service of Christ as a soldier. And as a soldier, Paul says that he should endure hardships, he should commit himself to the mission, and he should please his commander. And then number two, he should be strong in the service of Christ as an athlete. And as an athlete, Paul urges Timothy to run the race lawfully. And then number three, be strong in the service of Christ as a farmer. And as a farmer, Paul explains that Timothy is to work hard and partake of the fruits of his labor. And then number four, he says be strong in the service of Christ as a teacher. And as a teacher, he is to remember that his principal is observing him. So he should therefore study in order to prove his credentials prevent embarrassment, and correctly teach the Word of God in order to avoid false doctrine. And then number five, be strong in the service of Christ as a utensil. As a utensil or a vessel, he is to be set apart by following righteousness, faith, charity, and peace in order to be used for good as opposed to a dirty utensil or a dirty dish that no one wants to use for something good. And then number six, he says, be strong in the service of Christ as a servant. Finally, as a bond servant, literally as a slave to Christ, Paul tells Timothy he is not to fight, but to be nice to everyone, to be skillful in teaching, to endure whatever comes his way, and to be able to gently correct those that are in error.
Then, letter C, in chapter 3, Paul warns Timothy to withstand the apostasy from Christ. Now, the apostasy is the turning away from right to, to do wrong in the world. And this is how Paul says people will behave when you can know the apostasy has happened. He says people will be selfish, lovers of money, braggers, snobby, slanderous of God, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, wicked, unloving, promise breakers, slanderous, undisciplined, violent, despisers of good people, disloyal, stubborn, conceited, idolatrous, self-righteous, deceptive toward women, and against God's people. Now, what does that sound like? And Paul says that this will actually get worse and worse, but Timothy should continue in the Word of God and in its teachings that he learned as a child because it was God-breathed and profitable. And finally, Paul ends his second and final epistle to Timothy by charging him to preach the Word of God. Paul ends this epistle by charging Timothy to preach the Word of God at all times by pointing out error and teaching the truth. Why? Because the time was coming when people would rather hear a happy sermon than a holy one, and they will turn away from the truth as some already had done by forsaking Paul. But in spite of this, Paul declared that he was ready to die because he said he had fought a good fight, he had finished his course, and he had kept his faith. And therefore he knew a crown of righteousness was waiting for him. And he ends by telling Timothy that he wants him to come to him as well as Luke come with Mark so he could get right with John Mark and also bring his coat and his books with him before he died. Now that we've finished the book of 2 Timothy, let's move on to the book of Titus. Let's start by looking at some of the introductory material to the book of Titus. Letter A, this book was written by Paul, stated directly in Titus 1 verse 1. Then letter B, this book was written sometime between AD 64, or excuse me, 63 and 64. This book was probably written shortly after Paul's first Roman imprisonment, but before his final Roman imprisonment. So yes, technically this book would have been written before 2 Timothy, but remember we're not going through these books in a chronological fashion. We're going through as a typical order that is laid out in the New Testament. And then letter C, this book was written to Titus, obviously, named after him and stated directly in Titus 1 verse 4. Now, there is not much that is known about this individual except that he was an uncircumcised Greek who was converted by Paul but not mentioned in the book of Acts. And we know that he was living on the island of Crete, which is an island in the Mediterranean. Then Roman rule 2. Why did Paul write this book to Titus? Well, since it is one of the pastoral epistles, you can probably guess a couple of those reasons. First thing was to set things in order concerning the church, to give Titus instruction on church conduct and worship and proper dealings between members and the selection of order and uh, ordaining of bishops and elders, which actually is letter B. To call Titus to ordain elders in every city in Crete. So Timothy, excuse me, Titus is living on the island of Crete, and now Paul is challenging him to make sure he ordains elders and bishops in every city in Crete so the gospel could spread even more. In Roman number three, the major teachings in the book of Titus, the first thing he does in chapter one is he gives instruction concerning the selection of church bishops, elders, pastors. Now again, if you remember from the lecture from 1 Timothy, these 
titles are interchangeable. Each one deals with the office of the bishop. The elder just gives a good example of the respect that the individual has. And the pastor is more of a representation of the spiritual gift. Because if you remember, the word pastor is never actually used of the office. It's only used twice in the New Testament, and both times it's used in reference to a spiritual gift. Well, after Paul sends his typical greeting to Titus, he gives him the challenge to ordain elders and bishops in every city in Crete, which remember, that was the island that Titus was living on in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. And then Paul gives guidelines for selecting these bishops. Basically, they are identical to those guidelines that were given in 1 Timothy 3, except with the following. Here's some things that Paul gives Timothy, or excuse me, Titus, that he did not give in 1 Timothy chapter 3. He says first that the bishop should not be selfish. Then the bishop needs to be associated with good people. The bishop needs to be just. The bishop needs to be holy. And the bishop needs to be one who holds to and teaches sound doctrine of the word of God. And then letter B. Titus receives instruction concerning conduct among Christians in the church. Now here, Paul gave Titus specific instructions concerning the conduct of Christians of the church through the responsibility of aged men, aged women, and even servants. Concerning the aged men, the older men, they were told to exemplify godly character and that they should teach the younger men to control their thoughts and do good works by maintaining right doctrine and speaking the truth. Concerning the aged women, the elder women, they were also to exemplify godly character, and they were to teach the younger women to be clear-headed, to love their husbands and children, to be discreet, to be virtuous, to be maintainers of the home, and then to be submissive to their husbands. And then letter C. Paul ends this epistle to Titus by giving him instructions concerning the conduct of Christians in the world. Here in this chapter, Paul proclaims that all Christians should be obedient to those in authority over us in the world. We should be ready to do good works for those who are also in the world. We should not speak evil of anyone, and we should not fight, but be gentle and meek with everyone. Well, that brings us to the end of Lecture 23 for BIB 102 New Testament Survey. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or you need anything, please do not hesitate to contact me.